It's the DDL Players Cast, and we are here with one of the bigger names in the gaming community for various reasons. We will discuss that in a bit. I would like to welcome to the podcast Mark Ryan Hagen. Hi there. Thanks for having me on. Well, thank you very much for joining us today, taking some time out of Well, it's evening for you as you're in a different time zone. We had to play the time zone game to get this going, but we, yeah. ma- we managed to make it work. <laughs> I'm basically on the other side of the world, almost exactly from uh, San Francisco, my home in the States. It's, it's uh, 12 time zones away. So yeah, it's pretty, pretty uh, f- far away. <laughs> <laughs> and we will talk about that a little, but first let's... Start out by, for the probably one person that's listening to this that do not know who you are, why don't you start by introducing yourself a little bit to our audience? Well, uh, I'm uh, Mark Reinhagen. I'm an American uh, game designer. I was started by, uh, in college, uh, my uh, uh, friend and I, uh, Jonathan Tweet, who is uh, pretty well known himself for uh, Dungeons & Dragons Third. We wrote a game called Ars Magica. And uh, we won a bunch of awards, but like for that, but almost no money. I was still living very poor. And then I uh, came up with Vampire, and that was, of course, a huge hit. And the whole world of darkness sort of began from that. And um, and now, uh, after leaving the game industry and and you know working in politics and consulting uh, all over the world, I've uh, I uh, sort of got drawn back in, and now I'm doing a whole new company called Make Believe Games which has a whole uh, new series of uh, games, which is uh, like the World of Darkness, only it's science fiction. Can you tell us a little bit how you got started in uh, the gaming industry? Because you have been around for a while and made some pretty huge titles. So how did you get started? Well, um, you know, obviously I started by playing Dungeons and Dragons uh, as a kid. And uh, before that, uh, my dad and I would play war games. So, you know, we used to play Russian campaign pretty much all the time in our library of our house. We lived in a parsonage. Uh, We just had a a Russian campaign war game set up at all times, and we play one turn a day. And I just was obsessed with games. I was just that kid, you know, who was obsessed with games, absolutely obsessed. And uh, I never thought I could be a game designer as a living. So, you know, I had other plans, uh, you know, mainly Hollywood, (laughs) you know, being a a director. (laughs) Uh, writer as it was always my goal and then I thought to myself in college hey uh, I can't just walk into Hollywood um, I need a way to get there so I'm going to be a game designer as a way to get to Hollywood so uh, we did Ars Magica which is basically you know trying to do a magic system right uh, in a game you know which I think we did very well and then continued on with that in Mage and uh, yeah it was uh, you know a pretty uh then, then of course, uh, you know, uh, we moved on to, and, and I did uh, Vampire, which kind of, uh, you know, took me out of poverty, and uh, <laughs> you know, didn't exactly make me wealthy, but it, it did, it did let me uh, have a real life. And then uh, I was on the board of directors of Wizards of the Coast, and uh, uh, helped sort of get the whole Magic the Gathering thing going. I, I, uh, I, I sort of arranged for the the printer to print all those cards. <laughs> oh wow. And, and other things as well, uh, marketing and uh, you know and uh, and then uh, went to Hollywood as I had always wanted to to do the TV show and uh, and after a few years of working in Hollywood as a, you know, scriptwriter on other projects, I just sort of realized that that uh, it was just too dog eat dog a world for me and then I had to go back to the safety of games and uh, my other career politics. It was actually less doggy dog than Hollywood. Hollywood's <laughs> wow, vicious. Wow, really? Oh, it's vicious. Yeah, it really is. You think someone's your friend, and then no, no, not at all. You know. So if you're if you're a a movie star or you're a big time person, then you know everyone is your friend and they don't screw you over. But if you're nobody, they they will walk right over you. It's it's vicious touched a little bit on that you are several time zones away you want to tell our audience a little bit about where you're living now because it's kind of interesting actually oh yeah uh, i live in tbilisi uh, georgia not the state uh, the country it's a little country um tucked between russia and uh turkey um our nearby countries are syria and uh iran and uh armenia azerbaijan um 
And it's a very, I just fallen in love with this country. I used to work for the former president uh, in helping in politics, who's now actually running for president, a uh, prime minister of uh, Ukraine, uh, Misha Saakashvili. And, um, uh, you know, he kind of revolutionized this country and changed everything. And, uh, you know, it's just uh, I'm, I'm wonderful to, to see a country sort of evolve from a former Soviet, Soviet republic into this, you know, prosperous, growing, modern place. It, it's just uh, – it, and it's uh, also just, uh, you know, I'm a very short plane right away from all the different countries I hadn't really explored very much. So I'm a short ways away from India, from Central Asia, Russia, Middle East, and so, uh, you know – I can do a lot of uh, work trips quite easily to Kurdistan or, or, or whatever it is I'm working to, uh, you know, uh, it's just very convenient. And uh, I don't know. My, 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 my wife is Georgian. My kids are Georgian now. I mean, they're American, too. But but uh, yeah, we've it's amazing. We've settled in. It's, uh, you know, all too easy. Let's talk about your game company. You did mention it before. It is called Make Believe Games. Uh, tell us a little bit about, about the history of Make Believe Games. Uh, well, it all started with the board game Democracy. I was uh, trying to explain to people in the government how I thought democracy should work. And I said, you know, it's about compromise. And I said, what does democracy mean to you? And they said, it means that we win the election and then we do whatever we want. <laughs> we take over. <laughs> And at the time, all my friends were in the opposition. So after work, I would go hang out with my friends and the Georgian friends, and they would be like, um, I said, what do you think democracy is? This? And they said, well, it means that once we win the next election, we're going to kick those b- out and we're going to do whatever we want. And I said, well, what about compromise? What about meeting in the middle? And, and they were like, absolutely not. And of course, that is increasingly the attitude in America as well, that democracy is not about compromise or finding a balance. It's about just doing whatever you want which I think is all wrong. So I decided to sort of write, create this little game to sort of teach them what democracy, how the compromise worked. Like in the, in the board game, you actually, com- you actually have to negotiate and compromise with people constantly to win the game, just like in a real democracy. That's how laws get made. And, uh, um, and so I had meant to do it just as a sort of a lark, and then people loved the game so much, I decided to put it on Kickstarter. And the next thing I knew, I was thinking about a new uh, world, uh, <laughs> you know, like the world of darkness, only this is called uh, Anomaly. Uh, and I just kept thinking and kept thinking, and, and next thing I knew, I was uh, um, fully back into it. And I put my political career kind of on hold, and um, I've been doing working full-time on uh, on game stuff. And speaking of that game stuff, you currently have a Kickstarter that is running right now. It's uh, as we record this, there is Absolutely. three days to go, and it is uh, fully funded already. So you're into the stretch goals, and that is for Toxicity. I am zombie. So let's get into that. Yeah, the idea of that was uh, um, uh, basically it's a hoax. I mean, we're we're uh, you know I shouldn't I should probably should. Uh, you know, do this whole, um, you know, performance art thing where I, I, I pretend it's real, but <laughs> I, I just can't be bothered right now. Um, you know, it's a, it's meant to be a, a, a the second role playing game from the seventies. And that was banned and, and buried in a warehouse in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. And, and, uh, it was about zombies in the seventies. Uh, but really, of course we just wrote it as kind of a fun Lark, but it's basically a way to do dungeon crawling, old school Renaissance type gaming, but in a new context. So the idea is that the zombies, uh, these intelligent zombies, these toxic, live under the city streets of New York or other big cities, and they're kind of held there in a sort of a quarantine. The, the government kind of, you know, doesn't allow them to to come up to the surface, so they kind of sneak to the surface and hang out. But then underneath the levels they live in are these deeper levels where there's all kinds of fiends and skags and, and uh, crazy stuff going on. So you can do sort of a, a dungeon crawl, but in a whole f- different way. You know, you have instead of fighting a, a dragon, maybe you fight a, uh, a 57 Buick that's been infused oh, with, nice. uh, with uh, you know, the toxic virus and is semi-animated. And, uh, you know, it can talk by dialing around its uh, radio and... And we just we just have a a lot a lot of fun with it, just sort of going 
way, way over the top. And, and I'm, I'm a big fan of the 70s movies, um, especially black exploitation movies. So, you know, uh, grindhouse movies. And so the, the whole I Am Zombie game is sort of based on that anyway. So it was just so much fun to, to write this and have it be set in the 70s and go full on in, in that direction. I did notice there was a very, very much of a oh, grind, grindcore, grind school feel to it from uh, the grindhouse movies. And I yeah. wondered if that was intentional, and apparently it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, both uh, Mark Kelly and I, he, Mark Kelly's the, our, our artist who uh, who pretty much uh, on the main I Am Zombie game, which is set in modern times, by the way. I mean, he, he uh, this is I think it's the first time this has ever been done before, but he, he literally laid out and did every piece of art in the field manual, which is a huge th- hardback book. Full color every page, and uh, you know it's a pretty uh, amazing experience. But uh, yeah, it's it's very very grindhouse, uh, I would say. You know, which um, you know not everyone's into, but but I think it's just a perfect setting for a role playing game because oh, it, definitely, it, yeah. it's just a very loose and flexible setting. You know, and there's other settings that aren't quite as you know don't work as well for a role playing game. For a role playing game, you need that kind of uh, freedom you know to do anything you want and to sort of you know amaze and titillate your fans and your 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 players so i, I love grand house for that reason what was the decision that you made to give it an old school slash osr feel to it because i notice it it has that a lot in reading the rules and the preview that you sent over for me well uh i have two friends uh scott martin and uh ca suleman who are both pretty well known in the old school renaissance world. And, you know, and so, of course, we've been chatting about old school renaissance for years. And, uh, you know, since my days with Ars Magica, I've always sort of wanted to sort of take the, you know, my childhood love, these dungeon crawls, and somehow make sense out of it. You know, like be able to do a dungeon crawl and not feel like I'm in some computer game from the 80s, you know? Mm Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I, you know, somehow feel like it makes somehow storytelling sense that it could be made into a movie and it wouldn't be silly. And so Ars Magica, I did the Broken Covenant of Calibus, which is like my attempt to do a dungeon, as I said in that, a dungeon done right. It was just like a, a way to sort of have a whole cool dungeon and it actually has a backstory and, and it, it all makes sense. It, why the monsters in this room makes sense. It's not just a... You know, some monster sitting there for a hundred years, and then as soon as someone walks in and attacks them, you know, uh, you know, which is which is fine when you're a kid, but when you get older, you don't want that. And so, it just was natural to sort of like do that for this game, is to sort of go ahead and and uh, figure out how to do the dungeon right in in kind of a '70s modern world setting. It was like it was just sort of a you know, and I think we did it. I think I think you know, it, it could easily be made into a movie. It has that you know, it's uh, maybe a slightly fun, silly movie like big trouble in little china style movie but it, it could it could definitely be a movie so is this an add-on to i am zombie or is it kind of an extension to it or how well, exactly it's, are it's, you it's, seeing that it's actually you know we're selling it as the just like the original D and in three books so uh you know basically it's its own game but almost all the material can be used as an add-on to the other i am zombie game so so it's both. It's both its own game and and an add-on at the same time. And this runs on the Axiom system. Can you yes. tell me how you designed that? Because it's a very unique system, I think. Yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, I mean, my thing about role-playing is that I think that it has been, you know, people get so angry at me sometimes when I say this, but, but you know, it's sort of stuck in the 70s. You know, like board games of the 70s, you used to have photocopied pieces of paper and, and you filled things out with a pen and, you know, all that kind uh, of thing. the good old days. You know, and but no board game would be caught dead requiring you to use a pen. It, it just is not part of what a board game is today. Right. And, and no one would want to do it. No one wants to have to photocopy. And certainly, you know, very few people want to read a lot of rules. You know, the most popular board games right now are board games like King of Tokyo. Which you know has very short rules, and and I think role playing games have just sort of gotten stuck in this mindset of you know hey you need a book of three hundred pages of rules, but 
you know, having lived in Georgia, where when I first moved here, there were no board gamers at all, and certainly no role players. And now, by the way, you know, from, partly from my work, uh, there are so many board game clubs, and there are role players, and there's a thriving scene. You know, and it, it took eight years, but we got it going. Um, but I just saw from their faces that I said, here's a game. And they go, there's 300 pages of rules, really? <laughs> and you have to spend a whole evening making a character? I have to spend the whole evening? And I go, yeah. And they go, no. Let's let's play a choir. Let's play Catan. Okay, I'm not going to do that. And they absolutely refused. So one day I came with this idea of of doing these cards. And so I made up all these cards, and I said, all I'm going to do to make a character is pick five cards. And each card is an archetype, a trope. And, and it, it captures some part of the game. And out of these 108 cards, just pick five, and that's your character. And uh, then I went further, and I said, okay, actually just pick from these 54 cards that are the human cards. And we're going to start you out in an outbreak. So I don't even have to explain the game rules to them or the setting. I just said, hey... You're hanging out at the county fair, and you hear a scream, and you see this guy walking towards you with blood all over his face and a glazed look in his eyes. What do you do? So basically, like, I could have people start a role-playing game knowing nothing about role-playing, knowing nothing about the game rules, knowing nothing about the setting. All they do is pick five cards, and it makes it completely simple and easy to begin role-playing. And that's the purpose of the system, to make it uh, a very modern board game style game with very simple easy rules and it's super easy character creation super easy you know combat everything everything's based on the same dice rolls but you know but just like a board game every role you make is a bet it's like a a decision making process this is not a binary result yes you make it no you don't it, you you have to remake rerolls and you have to make decisions so you know i i feel it's a uh, it's my attempt to really modernize role playing. And one of the most interesting things about it, you took a totally different approach with your zombies, as the zombies in Toxicity are very highly intelligent. So, what made you decide to go that route with the zombies versus, you know, the, you know, the shambling brains type of zombie? Well, I mean, honestly, it just came up as someone, you know, once said to me, like, you did all these different monsters and. Uh, in the um, world of darkness, and you humanized them and you made them into characters, then how come you didn't do that with zombies? And I went, well, because zombies are mindless. And then I went, oh, wait a minute. Um, and I remembered one of my favorite, favorite characters in uh, Glorantha is the zombie king. And he's this, he's this guy who has all these zombies, and he can make them do whatever he wants, you know? And he has an army of zombies. And I was thinking, well, what if zombies had a master? And the master was intelligent. And then boom, 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 I started thinking, and I realized, oh, yeah, I can, I can do a game about zombies. And it just all came about. And, and also let me really deal with themes that I really am interested in. You know, I, I'm very interested in the theme of slavery and how people can live with themselves, you know, having slaves. And, and yet at the same time, you know, here I am in Georgia, and I have, you know, uh, you know I, I have the benefit of having very low – wages here so i can afford to have you know people work for me and do things that in america i'd have to do myself and and so you know that this is sort of exploring all these ideas and so you are as a toxic an intelligent zombie and and you have you know many skags and skags are like the, the classic tv you know movie uh zombie you know mindless but you can train them and the more time you spend with them to train them, the more intelligent they get. They get. Now they can never really talk or anything, but you can train them to sort of, you know. And, and um, I don't know. It just it, for role playing, it's it's basically uh, really really funny. <laughs> you know, the, the, the for me, the, the the best things about role playing is you're able to laugh and have a good time with your friends. Exactly, and, and that's really what it's all about. I think. I think so. I mean, it's just you know, and, and role playing is so much more than board gaming. Leads to those situations where you are just all laughing so hard. And, and and with zombie, I just am so proud that that I mean this is the most fun game I've ever made because zombies are funny, you know. And then and then and when someone role plays one of the skags, you know, it just I don't know. Each time it just ends up being so freaking funny, even though <laughs> even though you know, you know it's not. 
I don't know. I feel bad about it sometimes. Like, oh, we're laughing about someone losing their mind and becoming. But, you know, it's a dark kind of humor. And I, that's my favorite kind of humor. And as I uh, mentioned at the top here, the Kickstarter for Toxic- Toxicity I Am Zombie does have three days to go. As we record this, you are into your stretch goals. Yeah, and I really want to make the, the mixtape. We have a 1970s mixtape as one of them. I really want to hit that one. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we can do it. We we are getting there. And when are you looking to launch this? Uh, when will uh, players be able to get this in their hands? Well, we've had some hitches in the past with Kickstarters, although we have fulfilled everything. Um, but, you know, I try to do this company on my own completely. And now... Uh, we have a team of uh, many people from all over the world, and uh, and this is sort of our test of our new system. Um, so our goal on this is to within you know a week or two of the Kickstarter coming out, uh, we plan to get the PDFs to the backers, and at the same time we're going to send it to the printers. So we want to get this fulfilled very very quickly, and then as soon as we do that, we're going to do our next Kickstarter, which is going to be Hail Cthulhu which we're doing in conjunction with Chaosium, we hope. Oh, awesome. Which is going to be kind of a flip side of the <clears throat> Call of Cthulhu in that you play the cultists, you play the monster, you are the bad guys. Well, of course, that's the kind of game we always love to do. <laughs> so is there anything else you want to say about Toxicity I Am Zombie before we move on here to some other things? Uh, well, just that uh, uh, it's uh, I think it's a really fun and wild setting. Like uh, it's a little weird, I know, like going back to the seventies, but uh, you can use that dungeon crawling stuff in the present day as well. But uh, personally, I I really think it's funny to play in the seventies, especially with people who don't really remember it or even were alive then. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Uh, you know, we just you know, I just tell everyone, hey, watch this movie. And then you'll, you'll get into it, you know? And so I, I freaked some people out by having them watch Midnight Cowboy, uh, and they were really freaked out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. And now I would be remiss if I did not bring up Vampire the Masquerade. Let's go back to the moment you came up with the idea for that. Tell me about the moment you decided you were going to create Vampire the Masquerade. I was very hungry. I was living, literally hungry. I was living on Dale Donuts and uh, ramen noodles. And I was, our, we lived in this house in Atlanta. And uh, to save the company, and I had basically merged with White Wolf Magazine and Stuart Wick, who had more business sense than I did. And he kind of said, I'll do the business stuff, keep us surviving. You do a couple hours of warehouse work on the porch and the rest of the time, you just focus on getting us a new game. And I went, okay. And um, the first game I was working on was called Inferno. And it was about uh, being a famous person in hell. And, uh, and we just had these bad luck. Every time we play tested, things bad things happened. The final straw was we were play testing, and I just stood up in front of the fireplace and said, I am Asmodeus. Lord of the Depths. And then, crash, we heard. And all the lights in the house went out. <laughs> and we ran outside. And the pizza delivery, Domino's pizza delivery guy, had left his break off and had rolled down into the neighborhood transformer, which happened to be in our front yard. And and he ran, was running the hill, and he was trying to start his car. And I was like, dude, it's leaking gasoline right there. Okay, you got to get out of there. You got to get out. It's going to catch fire. And he wouldn't get out. Finally, I ran over and I literally pulled him out of the car. And uh, a few minutes later, the gas tank exploded. The whole car was on fire and it blew up every computer, every phone, every electronic device in the entire office of White Wolf. That's a little ominous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a little ominous, a little scary. And I went, okay, okay, so I am not going <laughs> to do this game anymore. And I, and I, yeah. and I, and I am not at all, uh, uh, you know, someone who, who buys into this stuff. I'm a very scientific, rational guy. But right. I was like, even I have to see the – Yeah, can I say – I you see, know, I see the writing on the wall here. <laughs> yeah, but I knew that I wanted to write something very, very dark and very – and so I remembered that uh, – Back I, after after I dropped this Inferno, I remember Jonathan Tweet and I had gone to see uh, the Lost Boys movie, and we saw it in the movie theater. 
And and I, and I remember on the way back out through the parking lot, he and my sister and I were talking. He went, man, it would be so cool to have a vampire game, but it would just get boring killing only vampires all the time. And I remember saying to him, yeah, you're right, but there's probably a way to do it where the game is not about killing vampires. And he goes, yeah, I don't, no, there's no way you can do it. And I go, I bet you, I bet you I can. And of course, um, I make these bets all the time, right? It's a huge motivator for me when I bet someone and prove I'm right. You know, it's a childish teenager flaw of mine, but I use it to, so anyway, I remembered that. I was like, okay, how would you do it? So I just started renting vampire movies. And, uh, and I realized that, you know, the current conception of vampires, you know, this is like the early 90s, late 80s movie genre, uh, was very limited. I, I couldn't really create a role-playing session, uh, a, a role-playing session around this very limited, there's a couple of vampires that go running around and killing things and blah, blah, blah. But as soon as I realized that I could combine my favorite movies, like Godfather 1 and 2, and, and sort of make the vampires sort of a secret society, a, uh, you know, a, <clears throat> a crime organization, basically. That's when it all came together, and and uh, I was able to make the game. And looking back on it now, uh, what do you think of the success that Vampire the Masquerade had? It's absolutely amazing. Like to think that all these vampire TV shows. I mean, I don't watch them. But people write me every single day on various social networks, and they tell me, on this episode, this happened, that comes directly from this book. You wrote this, you know, and all the time I'm getting uh, this stuff. It's just, it, it, I, you know, it's just amazing to think that, you know, the whole idea of vampires and werewolves being in this perpetual war and hating each other, I made that up. It's just so humbling. To think that this has become part of the pop culture, this new conception of vampires being sort of a mafia, clans, uh, a secret society that that hides, and you know, I mean, uh, you know, Anne Rice, I think, did far more uh, for vampires than I did, but I, I'm definitely in there, and, and and that what we did at White Wolf, all of us, was you know, uh, sort of transform uh, not only vampire myth the vampire trope, but we transformed the monster trope. And I think we ha- will have a legacy that will live on for a long, long time. And there was a short-lived, very short-lived, unfortunately, TV series, Vampire the Masquerade, which I absolutely loved. And as a side note, still every couple of months, I'll break out my DVD set of it and watch it because the show was just amazing and it ended way too soon. But- <laughs> yeah, Mark Mark died, man. That was yeah. the worst. How involved were you with the the show? I was pretty involved. Uh, so involved that they they kicked me off the set regularly because uh, oh, I wow. refused to sign the contract. Um, they actually started shooting it without having a contract with us, which I thought was crazy. But they basically didn't give a crap about me, and so I had to you know uh, threaten a lawsuit and uh, uh, go to town basically. And in, 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 in response, they, they banned me from the set. And uh, and so it got very, very ugly. But um, that's just, you know. And that was just the beginning of my Hollywood story. <laughs> you know, uh, a Hollywood's vicious, you know. If, if you're somebody, it's great. But if you're not, uh, if, you're, if you're struggling to like work your way up, it, it's, uh, yeah. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of lost souls in, in L.A. Who, who've sort of been left behind. So you you had kind of mentioned uh, the lead character actually Mark in real life uh, died. It was from a motorcycle accident, if I do believe. Yeah, yeah, he died. He was riding a little recklessly. He was very much a daredevil. If so, if he wouldn't have died, do you think Kindred the Embrace would have lasted a little longer than just the yes, one absolutely. season that it did? Did absolutely. you have had plans to you know like the future story? Yeah, actually, uh, our, our plans was to go back to my original conception, which was you know no cops except in a minor role, you know, focus on the vampires, focus on their politics, you know, do all that kind of stuff. And um, uh, it was going to be great. And, uh, you know, Mark and I were good friends. Um, he was just a, you know, he and I are both gadget geeks and we would, we would hang out all the time with our, what now seems to be so dated. But um, what was the Apple data thing? 
you know, the, the handheld device, the Newton. Oh, yeah. Okay, so yeah. yeah, the Newton. He, he and I were early at that. We each had a Newton. And we're, oh, wow. We were, we were, like, showing them off, and the, everyone was rolling their eyes, and we would, you know, he and I would play chess, and, you know, we were just, he was such a geek, you would not believe. He really was. He's just a wonderful, wonderful guy. And uh, I, I have never uh, cried for someone dying more than him. You know, I really, you know, you know, really, really liked him. And uh, it, was, it was just really bad. He was so generous also just going out, you know, like he would get all the attention. Of course, he's like this was an amazing looking guy, right? He was so good looking. And no one would look at me, of course. And, <laughs> and, and you know, I'll be out, why would they? And he was just so nice and generous about, you know, making sure people paid attention to me as well and, and sort of pulling everyone in. He was just uh, just just one of those amazing people. I miss him so much. Uh, I really wished I could have would, you could still call him, you know. There was a uh, another kind of short-lived card game that was Vampire the Eternal Struggle. Did you have any involvement in that at all? It was I mean, that... semi-loosely based on Vampire the Masquerade. So... Yeah, the, the, the it was the second trading card game basically ever made, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, yep. Yeah, uh, um, yeah. I worked with uh, um, Richard Garfield. So Richard, uh, uh, you know, is just a fantastic guy. And, uh, um, you know, and, and it's a great game. Uh, it's just really, really complicated. But, I mean, it has a legacy. I mean, people still play it. Like, there's a big group in Brazil and in, in Rio that they play it every week, and they send me pictures all the time of them playing. You know, and this is not just there, all over the place. Mark Kelly, our, our lead artist, is a huge fan. And I'm always surprised at, at how many people actually got involved with Vampire through that game, you know, because I mean, really, I think most people came in through uh, through the LARP scene, which I purposely, you know, built to sort of pull in non gamers. It was sort of my way to sort of expand role playing was to do these LARPs and then pull people into buying the books, you know. Yeah, I was going to ask about the whole LARP thing and how that came about. I'm sure there's a story behind that. Oh, I'm actually really proud of it. Uh, I recently went to a convention in uh, Denmark, uh, and uh, it's sort of the home of the Nordic LARP scene. And, um, uh, and it's a really elite but small convention, a wonderful, wonderful place to go. And they really nurture and push forward sort of Nordic LARP, which is very much this artistic, small group, no rules sort of LARP style. And, and 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 they told me, wow, I don't know if you know this, Mark, but when you came here 20 years ago, you know, when Vampire first came out and you ran a LARP, that was the first LARP most of us had ever played. And I was like, what? <laughs> and I was like, so this Nordic LARP that I revere and love and I'm just always talking about Nordic LARP, I had a part in that being created? And they're like, yeah. And I remembered, oh, yeah, I spent like three years when Vampire first came out traveling America and traveling the world running with no help all by myself a larp everywhere i went so like i would run a 500 person larp in brazil and france germany any country i went to any convention i'd run these huge larps with just me understanding what's going on which i don't if you know anything about larping is it's ridiculous oh yeah i i i will be honest i have never been brave enough to actually try it I want to, but it scares me to try it. I don't really know if I want to or not, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I can see that. I think I think once you do it once, though, you'll find it, oh, yeah, it's nothing. It's, it's like people, how people feel about role-playing, right? Right, oh, exactly. I don't want to be someone else. That That's scary. And then as soon as they do it, they're like, oh, yeah, I remember doing this when I was seven, <laughs> you know? Yeah, well, uh, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I'm just, I, I think that those three years of me – you know, with the energy of a punk kid, uh, you know, and, and the confidence, uh, out of place confidence that I could tell 500 people and make them have a good time. Uh, I'm sure now that I couldn't do it because everyone knows LARP well enough. Now they want something more. But but I was able to create enough spectacle and, and have them do the stuff that they they could play it. And um, and that, that kind of sort of spread LARP everywhere. And I think that's a huge part of Vampire Success. Is that there were LARP groups in every town? San Francisco had a huge LARP group that all the guys from Boing Boing played in. 
You know? Oh, wow, really? Oh, yeah. I mean, the people who played the Vampire Larva, it, it astounds me. To this day, I meet celebrities, and they're like, oh, yeah, I played Vampire Larp, dude. I'm like, really? Yeah, I, I'm always surprised. Well, yeah, it that was would... big. I mean, I mean, at one point, I think we figured out there were, like, you know, millions of people playing Vampire Larp. That would have to blow your mind, though, to think about that. Just think about how many people you touched in that way. That, yeah, it's, you know. it's a little, little weird for me because I'm, I'm actually not, you know, one, one reason why I live in Tbilisi, Georgia, is that, you know, it was a place for me to sort of hide, you know, like, like, like it was just weird for me to walk in malls in America and people would stop and ask me for an autograph if I walked through a mall. Like, and, and, and I'm just not into that, you know? Right, right. I, you know, and, and, and some people are, and I, I'm not saying anything against that. I, I, I'm just personally very, you know, I, I just prefer not to be known. I like to be anonymous. I'm the guy behind the politician. I don't want to be the politician, you know? Uh, I want to be the guy behind the stage watching everyone's reaction. I do not want to be giving the speech, Okay. So I come to Georgia, and the first five years, no one knows who I am. Oh, wow. So in the community here, in, in the president's offices, in the, in, the, in the government, no one knows. And no one thinks to look me up on Wikipedia. Because you don't <laughs> normally, you just don't look up people, well, right? Yeah, I mean, exactly. At least, you know, you just don't think of it. And no one thought of me as anything. And then one time I was at a party, and someone was making a joke about looking me up on Wikipedia. I said, oh, please don't do that. And they all stopped and looked at me and go, oh, no. well, what do, you, what do you mean? You're on Wikipedia? <laughs> and I was like, uh, no, no, actually no. And it was too late. It was too late. They looked me up. The cat was out of the bag. And, and I tell you, like people came out of the woodwork. There, was, there, there were so many people living here who knew who I was or had a friend who knew who I was or blah, blah, blah. And yeah, it just it just ruined my life. <laughs> Going back to the LARP scene, can you see maybe that evolving uh, into Toxicity? I am Zombie in any. Well, I mean, the, I mean, the card system is designed to be to let you go from LARP to tabletop seamlessly with the same character, the same cards. That uh, everything's designed pre-designed. You know, with Vampire, I had to sort of add in the LARP rules afterwards because I didn't. You know, I was just beginning. I didn't, but this time everything's pre worked in. And not only that, but the whole system is designed for what I'm preparing for. The whole purpose of make believe games is to prepare for the virtual reality, the VR, MR, AR universe that's coming. And, and, and you know, I'm completely convinced that, you know, we're going to have this seismic shift in entertainment with augmented reality, mixed reality, and virtual reality. And, and and once everyone is you know you know wearing these glasses basically, which we will be, I'm completely convinced. Then then that will just change entertainment completely, and I want to be ready for that. And I think role players are the ones who are the have the best skills for creating entertainment for this kind of interactive storytelling. Are the only ones who know how to do it. The only ones in the world who know how to do it. And, and I want to be there to do it. And, and actually, the card system is designed to be. A modular, you know, system to help you create a character in a mixed reality or virtual reality world. Now, see, I've taken a lot of your evening up here, so we're going to slowly wrap things up here. Have a question that might be tough for you. This is kind of like asking, like, which one is your favorite kid? But which <laughs> out of all the games you've created, what is your quote unquote favorite one? And which one did you have the most fun creating? Well, of course, I'm going to say toxicity because you know, <laughs> of course it's on Kickstarter, right? <laughs> no, but I, I, you know, I people ask me about clans all the time, like what's your favorite clan? And I always say, you know, you can't choose a favorite among your children. You know, you don't really have a favorite. Now, now, what game would I want to play the most right now? Like not throughout my life, but right now, what game would I want to play? You know, if I didn't have to run the game, right? If someone else ran it. I'd probably dig Changeling. Wow, that's an, ex an unexpected answer, actually. Yeah, if someone else is running <laughs> it. You know, I, I could I could do an old school uh, vampire game. Uh, honestly, uh, if someone was running a really cool I Am Zombie game, I would be way down with that because, you know, I can still fix it. You know what I mean? <laughs> I can still add stuff. There you you know, so so like if I play a game, of course I keep a notebook by my hand. And I'm writing notes the whole time. I'm getting ideas, ideas, ideas. You know, that's just how, I, you know, that's for me, that's what's fun. And 
it's frustrating to play my older games because I can't I'm not in charge anymore. I, I can't I can't add these ideas to the game. Yeah, you can't go back and quote unquote fix them. Yeah. Although, you know, with this world I can. I, I'm completely in charge. I can do anything I want and, you know, I'm gonna do twenty games twenty years. You know? So so I have this whole magnificent mad scheme and uh so any idea can can work its way in and you did kind of touch on it a little earlier but uh what's next for you guys at make believe games well the 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 next kickstarter will be this hail cthulhu which is uh super excited about where you basically play the bad guys it's the flip side of call cthulhu so um i think that's going to be just a, an amazing uh game ca Suleiman is the one who is going to be in charge of that but i'm of course working on it it uses the cards so it's going to be super super simple rules very modern rules uh and also you know very evocative you can you can get anyone to play you can convince people who would never game before to do it we're using these cards and i think it's gonna be our big breakthrough product and then after that we have the second game in the anomaly series which is xeno factor which builds on the whole i am zombie uh you know world uh only it's about uh flying saucers and aliens and the idea is that you are agents of the aliens that you are basically uh men in black sort of our matrixy version of that uh, but you are you work for the aliens. You're spies who spy on Earth for the aliens, who you don't know or meet or really know much about, but you work for them. So, and then that was just the second game of the this whole series that's going to explore our solar system and reveal truths about our universe that we here on Earth know nothing about. Well, both of those sound interesting, and we will be sure to keep all of our audience updated <laughs> on those. And, of course, awesome. the Toxicity I Am Zombie. We're going to keep an eye on that Kickstarter. And uh, looking forward to all the great things that we're going to get from uh, Make Believe Games. Awesome. So thank you very much for taking some time out of your evening to uh, join us. You bet. Uh, thanks for having me on the show. I had a good time. <laughs>